I shouldn't tell this, but I, uh, I've been up probably about 145 or so. Once. That's something I don't want to do all the time because it's not good. Uh, I told him two more years, but I know he's going to be trying to talk me. I already know that. Now, you don't have to do this much now. You just you know, ride around and check on things. I know that's what's coming. Okay, he's not gonna let me get, you know, I'm not gonna help, not get uh, totally away from it. I just won't do this, be as involved, so to speak, in a physical standpoint. Pretty much, switch from one thing to the other. Can't see you'll find an easier job for me after that, but I don't know. <laughs> Baby brother got talked me into it. First he talked, say, well, well, you get attracted with Kevin here. I said, that's for you. <laughs> but I see it's for me. And the year's not gonna get any easier though. Cause he talking about more acreage, more acreage, more work. You know, most people told me don't plant past, I think one time it was like uh, June 15th. Then I heard, don't plant past July. These were planted in middle of August. What's different about this field, everything clicked. We had day one, we planted, we had irrigation to it with water, we had nutrients to it, and this is in less than a month. See how tight the spacing is? So the tighter this space right here, this bud, the more biomass you have, because that's what you're looking for, the quality and the weight. That's gonna drive more weight. We probably replanted, I would say, 40% in this whole field. This is theft, <laughs> people um, coming by and just stealing plants, um, picking them out. And do they know that it's not? Yeah, but they don't care. We have security here 24 seven now. <laughs> Nice, big, juicy buds. <laughs> I mean, good. They look gorgeous. Look at these things. Big, fat colas. They're beautiful. Kevin, you guys are already at 20% CBD in some of these plants? Really? They're, I mean, look at these colas. And this isn't even like the superstar, but I mean, they're gorgeous. I've been involved in agriculture now for about 25 years. You know, farmers are the founders of civilization and, you know, it has such an impact. The way that we treat the land and the way we, we farm has such an impact on the way that communities live and thrive or, or, or don't. And you see across the world the way that agriculture is practiced in different places has a direct and indirect impact on the health of those people, on the health of the economy, on the culture. So when I first started working with Kevin, it was the fact that he really wanted to help his community that attracted me to this project. He's going back to the family farm. So his roots are in agriculture, his branches are in technology, and his fruits are in legacy. And I think that's what's so cool about this project is Kevin is, Kevin is courageous and he's innovative and he's a leader in this community now. And people are now starting to see, okay, somebody's taking a little risk Somebody's trailblazing and they're growing organically and they're using technology and they're growing crops that, are, that aren't the same old crops. And at the end of the day, like what we're really trying to do here is help this community find opportunities to come together and support them, each other in farming in a way that can make money again for them but also can be good for their land and good for the health of their, their community. You know, the beauty of it you know, with the drip is that you're only putting water where, where the plant it. is, right. and you're not putting water on top of the plant, which creates all the issues with mold right. and mildew. And the nutrients. I mean, we've had big debates with our guys that, who would say, hey, you don't need all those nutrients, you just need water. Well, I can show you some fields that just had water. <laughs> so you need both. And if it wasn't for the drip, the water's important, but the food is twice as important coming through the drip. 
And to your point, you know, some people use pivots and they put a bunch of water and food over it, but it doesn't hit the plant. They're wasting a lot of water yeah. and food. We tried some without the plastic because everyone kept talking about, grow it without the plastic, Kevin, you'll see a lot better results. I will never, ever do this without plastic. Hopefully we'll do it with hemp plastic next time. Uh, hemp plastic, maybe that's better, but. <laughs> I was driving through here looking at these fields of soybeans and cotton, and it's just amazing how, like, uniform. uniform yeah. And that's decades and decades of breeding. And I think this is, while HGH seed is probably the most stabilized seed I know of on the market on the hemp side, it's still early, early stages of breeding. So tell me about these plants. This is, um, this is the first field that we planted. So these were planted out as starts, um, probably three week, one month old starts. So I mean, this is a nice hardy bud. It's sticky, it smells great. I mean, again, drying and curing it properly so that it retains the terpenes and the nose, the smell is important, but these are just nice, hardy, smokable flower, which produces the CBD that can be ingested through inhalation that gives more of an immediate effect as far as anti-anxiety, pain relief, helps with sleep, so many benefits and value of smoking but on the oil, it's still biomass. So from that, I mean, this can be turned into uh, a dried biomass milled that's gonna go into an extractor that's gonna yield your distillate, your isolate, depending on how you're handling it, that's gonna go into products, whether skincare, oils, tinctures, edibles, like gummies. So a lot of different ways to take the CBD, the cannabidiol out of these plants, to put them into products that people can consume. Because it's initial, uh, kind of driver in the market is CBD and, and the an oil yep. is that that's forcing people to really be mindful about how they farm it and what the chemicals and what goes into it because because it's human consumption and, and because of the process of making oil like things bioaccumulate and there's all these it's very sensitive the whole regional microcosm where there's an opportunity on a community-based level to be able to grow process and sell and benefit that same community totally exists. I see a correlation living in Asheville, North Carolina as Beer City. You're gonna have your InBevs, you're gonna have your Budweiser's and Coors and all the big boys, they're gonna come in and they're gonna scale and they're gonna figure out a way how to do this big time, drive down the price point, which is always gonna put the pressure on the farmer. And then you're gonna have the flip side, which is the craft beer industry, where you're gonna have growers, processors, extractors, and those boutique craft style brews it's really going to hone in on this benefit and the value and not bring this down, this plant to a very general base level, you know, 6%. You're going to have a higher CBD, other cannabinoids that they're going to be growing and extracting, generating great medicine that may be strain specific, that really speaks to the quality and tells the story from the farmer all the way to the consumer. And you can go into a store and choose and pick the very best that was grown and processed in your community. We're all about results, and we, we, we and we're all about long-term partnerships and good partnerships. And that's, and these guys have been hard on me starting off, <laughs> but they've been hard on every 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 person that comes around here. So that's what these guys are just protecting, you know, my investments, protecting the farm and everything, and um, and making sure that, you know, what the partners are recommending can actually we can execute.